Good morning, my dear audience. Actually, on behalf of the Department of English, University of Bulbongo, this is Amit Bhattacharya, your host, welcoming you to another session of the online lecture series that we are organizing. Because of the ongoing COVID crisis, we, our academic activities have migrated online. And in order to supplement the teaching efforts of our faculty members, and also in order to give a very much needed academic exposure to our students and scholars, we have thought about this particular online lecture series. Today we are really very happy to have in our midst Professor Kaiser Bob, the noted poet, translator, critic and essayist from across the border from Bangladesh. Now, Professor Kaiser Hawk has agreed to share his views about post post colonial poetry today. Professor Hawk, being a practicing poet, translator, and academician, has a unique vantage point to talk about post post colonial poetry. Now, friends, we all know that every product has a self life. Similarly, every slogan, every campaign has got a study date. Post colonialism that drew its sustenance by asking or interrogating the relationship between literature and imperialism by interrogating the point of intersection between the colonial, uh, colonizer's ideology and the colonized subjectivity has had its heyday. Now, because of globalization, because of the internet, we are having other issues to contend with as well. So, I hope Professor Hawk is going to enlighten us about the peculiar ways in which poetry as a literary genre in its unique way responds to the changing situation. So without further ado, let me request Professor Hawk to address us. It's over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. It's a pleasure to be uh, virtually in uh, the University of Gorbongo. I love the name because uh, it shows, uh, uh, it, it indicates uh, uh, the historical continuity. We should not forget our old names, you know. Um, so this is pre-colonial, and you have the colonial uh, age, and then the post-colonial, which is the subject of our talk. I was told by Amit that the theme would be post-colonial poetry. Uh, Revaluation, and for the title, I chose uh, what he has mentioned. Uh, is it time to talk of post post colonial poetry? Now, um, it, Amit has already indicated the the nature of the 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 context, the critical context. You see, which is that um, the the term post colonial. Um, has already become, in a sense, historical. Um, so um, uh, let me just begin um, by um, you know, giving a sketch of this uh, of the evolution of the post-colonial. Um, it's not a very happy term, and uh, from the moment it was it began to be used. People pointed this out. Uh, for example, Ajaz Ahmed said, you know, it gives too much importance to the link between the colonial and what followed, as if uh, relating to the colonial was of primary importance. So it, in, in fact, in a sense, uh, indicates that we have not uh, freed ourselves from the apron strings of the colonial. Well, yes, I mean, Every term, it's a, in understanding a term, it's always, it always helps to uh, 
see what is its opposite, the post-colonial, colonial. Now, um, the topic is post-colonial poetry. So what would be the uh, opposite of that? I mean, colonial poetry, but we have never studied colonial poetry as such. You see? Um, in the same way, uh, even when we talk of post-colonial poetry, I think um, it's a bit surprising that there aren't many anthologies. I haven't come across an, as a single anthology of post-colonial poetry in English. Uh, I was Googling yesterday, and I came across mention of uh, an anthology of post-colonial Filipino poetry, which makes sense. I mean, in Philippines, you know, there were colonial forces at work, you know, the Spaniards and the, the Americans. And then now that they're independent, there's a new kind of poetry that they're writing. There is post-colonial poetry. But um, if you think of the, uh, the world at large, the term post-colonial is pretty amorphous. Um, it began, uh, became popular in the late 70s and early 80s, in, in the 80s, basically. And um, the big impetus, of course, came from Edward Said's uh, critique of Orientalism. So I think that was the, the real um, moment when post-colonial became a, a vital um, intellectual force, because that was the what did I do essentially? I mean, there are two, I think there are two aspects to his uh, um, theorizing. One is a sort of Marxian one that um, in, you know he in, you know in uh, Marxist theory you have the superstructure and the infrastructure and the superstructure is all fraught and ideology, um, and so the colonial ideology was uh, revealed to be actually that. Uh, uh, rooted in what he analyzed in Foucauldian terms as the, um, you know, the, the uh, symbiosis of knowledge and power. So it's basically a Foucauldian analysis of uh, colonial discourse. And at one, at, at about the same time, some new uh, writers from the former colonies suddenly hit the global scene. It's quite interesting that when Said emerged as a major intellectual force, uh, Salman Rushdie emerged as a major uh, writer on the scene. So he won the Booker Prize and became, he, I mean, in a sense, he made the Booker famous. And so that was the, I think, the beginning of this uh, bold trend. And previously, of course, we had great writers. In fact, uh, greater writers than Rushdie, uh, uh, Arkan Aran, for, for example. But, um, they were seen in a different context. So the term post-colonial created a new critical context in which uh, literature could be seen. Now, uh, so soon afterwards, the uh, other cri critics you know, began to work in this area and came up with the idea of the empire writing back, which is a phrase from Rushdie in an uh, essay in 1982. He, um, talked about the empire writing back with a vengeance. And hence, you know, these anthologies, the empire writes back, and uh, followed by the big post-colonial studies reader. Um, so these are phenomena of the 19, late 1980s. Um, now, right from then, I, I found a problem with the way the post-colonial was uh, defined because it included the settler colonies, you know? so Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, alongside the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. Um, I find this a quite problematic because uh, we are not quite in, in the same boat. So, uh, and uh, sometimes even America is invoked. For example, Rajiv Patti in his book, he doesn't say that America is, a, is part of the post-colonial, but he says America was the first country to free itself from uh, Britain, but we don't uh, use the term post-colonial in relation to America, and we should also be like that, you know, so that we don't uh, have to deal with this term. Well, I think we have come out of that phase. We don't 
uh, feel burdened by the term post-colonial. But regarding America, this comment on America, America is not just uh, in, in, in any sense a post-colonial country. It did not just free itself from Britain. It superseded Britain, it superseded Europe, and became the new imperial power, imperial in quotes. You see? And right from the beginning of the American uh, nation state, they, the, uh, the, from, from the founding fathers onwards, um, they made it quite clear that they wanted to dominate the world. I'm beginning with, with, the, um, with the Americas and then extending their power to the, the, the rest of the world. So uh, the imperial ambitions were very clearly uh, 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 defined in the evolution of the United States. So America is in no sense, uh, so it, in a sense, the position of America is comparable to that of uh, the Roman Empire, which ab you know, absorbed and superseded Greek civilization. So America has done something like that vis-a-vis -vis Britain and Europe. Um, but we are not in a, a similar position. And to us, um, shaking off the burden of post-coloniality um, has to follow a different trajectory. And uh, it has slowly happened. So at first, when we were very enthusiastic about this burden, it had a, it, uh, about the term, it had very important uses for, I mean, to put it in, at a very basic level, there was a huge body of writing for which there was no critical framework. Um, and the term post-colonial provided a critical framework within which uh, all these writings could be discussed. So including uh, you know, prominent areas like say India, uh, Caribbean, um, parts of Africa, um, but also um, writings from uh, relatively obscure places. They could also be uh, dealt with within the context of the post-colonial um, critical uh, criticism. Now, um, the, the evolution out of the, this term began almost as soon as the term arrived. I mean, uh, Saidian critique was then joined by Feminism, which had already taken off in the 1960s, um, ideas from the civil rights movements, uh, subaltern studies, all of these became part of this big post-colonial uh, movement in quotes. Um, now, soon afterwards, a, a new term, I mean, uh, was latched onto the post-colonial, that is from, uh, that is the diaspora. So the empire not only rode back with a vengeance, but the, if we would say, if you want a slogan, the empire comes home to the old mother country to, to roost. So the diaspora became a big part of the post-colonial uh, scene. Um, and that too was a pretty short-lived phenomenon. Uh, why? because of the very um, nature of the, the concept of diaspora. And why was the term post-colonial diaspora coined? Why did it have such resonance? Because of the association of the term with the angst of exile suffered by the uh, Jewish diaspora. So it was felt that the Members of the post-colonial diaspora similarly um, you know, suffered the anguish of, of homesickness, um, exile, and that is true. You see, think of the, the post-colonial diaspora began when the mother countries invited workers from the former colonies to do the dirty jobs there. So, and once they went there, there was no coming back. Um, transportation was not developed. Um, the aeroplanes were small. 
um, if one settled in a country, coming back was actually in practical terms became unthinkable. So hence this diaspora sensibility of anguish and uh, the homesickness, uh, the pain of exile, etc. All this changed with the coming of uh, globalization and new technology. Now, um, communication is so much easier with WhatsApp and Viber and uh, you know Skype and uh, mobile phones and even uh, physical transportation with the white-bodied jets. I would say the coming of the white-bodied jets made a big difference to the world. And uh, I remember when, when I first went to England to do my PhD in 1978, we traveled in a British Airways VC-10. We from Dhaka would stop briefly at, in Delhi, and then we flew on to London. Um, such planes are now used only for um, internal flights, regional flights. And a wide body jet it has far greater capacity, uh, passenger carrying capacity and cargo carrying capacity. So now, I mean, you can get fresh uh, produce from the subcontinent in a grocery in London. So, and it is also possible for those who have become migrants there to come and visit their mother country once or twice a year. This has become a common practice. So um, the, instead of the diaspora now, I think the term uh, transnationality becomes uh, more uh, appropriate. So uh, <clears throat> with transnationality, which means that you don't belong to one country, you can move about, and there are families uh, spread over several countries, uh, and they are, uh, you know, ha have greater mobility than ever before, and, uh, something that was unthinkable. And then the um, migration of uh, the labor force, of professionals, that is, uh, people of different classes, this has also increased tremendously. So the, uh, the, the, the term diaspora, therefore, again, has become history. So, and with transnationality, with globalization, this, uh, you know, the binary of the colonial and the post-colonial also breaks down because uh, we now relate to a more complex um, economic uh, and political configuration in the world. Uh, this is uh, the stage we are in, I think, today. Now, along with uh, transnationality, I think the term translingualism has begun to attract attention. Um, writers are not, there are many writers who are transnational, there are many who are also translingual, and uh, this also is an increasing phenomenon. Um, well, it, it was there always, as uh, A.K. Ramanujan pointed out in one essay, that um, it was, it can be said that it um, is the norm in this subcontinent for writers to write in a language other than the mother tongue. So you speak Prakrit at home and you write in Sanskrit. And subsequently, you know, people wrote in uh, Persian or some form of Hindi or Urdu and then English. So writing, uh, being translingual is uh, not at all uh, alien to the cultural history of this subcontinent. Now, when it comes to poetry, as I said, post-colonial poetry exists as a label rather than as a corpus. Who is post-colonial? I mean, if you want to stud study uh, some aspect of post-coloniality, you can take some poets together and study them. But uh, apart from this use of, uh, from the value of such a uh, an umbrella term, as it were, it is not something that uh, is specific that specifies any substantive uh, qualities in a particular writer. 
in a particular port. So unless a port uh, directly addresses the problems or questions arising out of the colonial encounter and its aftermath, um, it's just a convenient, convenient umbrella term for the entire body of writing to emerge in the former colonies over the last uh, half century or so, or um, even more, I mean, ever, so ever since the post colonization began. So um, post-colonial cover everybody has written since the uh, coming of uh, colonialism. Now, so we are now in a, in a sense, in a post-colonial post situation. We are now in a, uh, in a globalized society, which has a new set of problems. Um, and the problems also are evolving. And uh, the writers will have to deal with them in, in, in their own way. Uh, today, um, if you talk about poetry, I think generalizations are not possible. So every poet in the broad context that we have identified as post-colonial has to relate for himself or herself what, uh, you know, you know, relate himself or herself to his immediate setting, the immediate tradition that is at hand, the broader regional tradition, the uh, tradition of Western literature and of world literature. So, and it is significant that as the term post-colonial gave way to, say, the diaspora or the transnational, uh, the ter term world literature came up. And at present, I think there are over a dozen universities in the West which offer degree courses, BA, in uh, world literature. Now, when I first heard about this, I just chuckled because the idea of structuring a, a degree program, a BA program in world literature, squeezing world literature into a three year or four year program seemed utterly ridiculous. But then when I thought about it, I realized that it's just a way of throwing the field wide open. So there is no single canon that is privileged over the others. I think this is the essence of this development. So you can, a student can mix and match, maybe study one, two, three languages and combine courses and in a sense create uh, his or her own curriculum. And it follows the way we actually study literature. If you think of uh, growing up and uh, falling in love with literature, I mean, how do we read? When, except for uh, our um, life in academia, where we are you know, guided by the curriculum. In our life as free individuals, what do we do? We, let's say today you pick up a book by Murakami, tomorrow you pick up a, pick up a, a, a Kundera, and then, and the next day an Agoda Christoph, then the, the following day an American writer or a Latin American writer, you see. Um, I think we, we are 
um, all literature lovers are in a sense <clears throat> wild readers and that makes reading more exciting so the concept of world literature i would say is uh, an attempt to accommodate this uh, very interesting aspect of human nature the way we uh, actually uh, relate to literature is uh, uh, reflected better in the concept of world literature about which theorizing began with Goethe and continued to Rabindranath and further beyond till today. So um, I see this as a positive sign rather than you know, a, a, a narrow phenomenon. And um, it is up to us readers, writers, and uh, academics to keep redefining the area. Now, in uh, the Amit made it clear that this is on poetry. So how do, does one relate to poetry? What kind of poetry is um, post-post-colonial? Or how has post-colonial poetry evolved? And frankly, uh, I, would, I feel quite lost <laughs> in dealing with this question. Because it can't really be answered. You can only um, say something from your own uh, narrow perspective. I see that in discussions of poetry, even in discussions of post-colonial poetry, I was just browsing through a few books, and it is often it's repeated that uh, this uh, the complaint is repeated that um, the critical study of post-colonial literature neglects or scants, you see, the, the poetry. So th there's a lot of criticism about of, of uh, post-colonial fiction, but very little on post-colonial poetry. And my response to that is, what do you expect? If you think of the body of critical work worldwide, most of them are about novels, fiction. There is, I mean, the relative importance of poetry, unfortunately, on the literary scene is much less than that of poetry or other prose forms. Even creative nonfiction, I think, uh, gets more attention. And this has to do with the way writing has evolved, with the way poetry has evolved, you see, because poetry, uh, to start with, poetry was all the words. The only form of poetry of writing was in verse in, in Bangla, for example. And even in the West, there was, um, there was more verse written than um, prose until recent times. So uh, the, uh, much of the function of verse has been taken over by poetry. And then the production the, uh, and transmission of poetry has undergone tremendous change. You know, the publication industry, for example, is not primarily interested in poetry. There are small publishers who are interested in poetry. And I think um, one uh, good de technological development is the coming of the print on order machines. So you will find many small literary publishers who, uh, in the Western world who uh, publish poetry, but they don't have to uh, you know, invest a lot print a um, large number of copies and find storage space, which is expensive. So instead, with a print on order machine, you can just print out uh, as many copies as are ordered. And this uh, has also, is also becoming quite uh, popular among uh, writers of uh, critical works. I recently, a, a colleague recently showed me a book by a very well-known 
Linguistics, and the book said that it was a it was a print, it was published using the print on order uh, technology. So, which means that uh, something published in that way will never go out of print. If somebody orders a copy, they can always print, you know press a button, have a copy, and send it. This is a positive development um, which should have a very beneficial effect on poetry publishing. And then the internet sales, um, an excellent way of uh, marketing, which I think will become more and more uh, useful. And the internet itself, I found that, I mean, when taking a class, I mean, the best way to have the text in front of everybody is to just Google the title of the big screen. Everyone can see it and can talk about it. But I think there's a lot more that can be done. So um, poets who are in far-flung remote places, I think, can use the internet to create internet poetry communities. So maybe someone in Rwanda is interested in writing a particular kind of poetry which has a resonance for me in Dhaka, and someone in PG, in some, someone else in London, and we can have a website where you know we can we uh, uh, present the, the kind of kind of poetry which we are writing. So I think um, these are uh, developments which uh, I I think can happen, and so the internet can become an important uh, forum. Um, just as it has become today, enabling me to cross the border. Um, so, uh, I think the transmission of poetry, the way poetry is transmitted and uh, published and uh, marketed, this will undergo uh, interest, interesting changes over the coming coming years. Now, you see, I was thinking at, uh, when I was uh, just jotting down some points, whether it would make uh, sense to read out a poem of mine and talk about it, and so, so that um, the issues that we have briefly touched upon can be then seen. Uh, there's a comment on it. Uh, let me put it to you. Uh, would you uh, do you think it would be a good idea for me to read a poem of mine and then talk about the, the issues that um, have arisen here in relation to that? Please do it, sir. Amit? Amit? Please do it, sir. Please do it, sir. Good, 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 good. Okay. So I'd like to read out the title poem of my book, the published in the streets of Dhaka. Um, okay, thank you. And uh, so, say, say a few words about it related to um, all the things we have been talking about. Um, is it a post-colonial poem? It is, um, but it is not just a post-colonial poem. It is, so let's see what you think. Published in the streets of Dhaka. The poem is dedicated to Ashish Nandi. Um, I called him my guru. And, uh, he, was, he smiled, he was quite, quite pleased. Okay. Anyway, so it's dedicated to Ashish Nandi. There's a, an epigraph. This whole poem was prompted by what I read in an essay by Gore Vidal. Who is a writer I greatly admire, you know, his moral courage, his uh, um, no-nonsense uh, critique of uh, American politics, all these are, make him a sort of 
Zero. But uh, he wrote an essay titled On Prettiness. He had gone to Cambridge and E.M. Foster was showing him around and this is what happened. Before that he says that the word pretty has really gone down in value. So pretty objects continued to be admired until 1875 when the phrase pretty pretty was, was coined. That did it. For the truly clever, apt and skillful the adjective pretty could only be used in the pejorative sense. As I discovered 30 years ago while being shown around King's College by E.M. Foster. As we approached the celebrated chapel, magnificent, superb, a bit much, I said, pretty. Foster thought I meant the chapel when actually I was referring to a youthful couple in the damp middle distance. A ruthless moralist, Foster publicized my use of the dread word. Told in Fitzrovia and published in the streets of Dhaka. The daughters of the Philistines rejoiced. The daughters of the uncircumcised triumphed. For a time, my mighty shield was vilely cast away. So, and then I, I really pulled me up short, published in the streets of Dhaka. He has never been to Dhaka. He doesn't know Dhaka. I think it's, he must have just plucked it out of the great uh, sort of a stretch of, uh, uh, you know, the remote places of the world, Dhaka. So if this story, this anecdote is told about, is uh, transmitted in the streets of Dhaka, I mean, that is the lowest point his reputation could reach. See, that is the implication that to be made fun of in Dhaka is something that would be the worst possible fate for a writer like him. So <clears throat> this entire poem is a response. Pretty, isn't it? Sure, he is caught you on the wrong foot. Mr. Morgan Forster broadcasts his priggish amusement over cigar and port in the King's SCR. The story travels swiftly, and why not? It's suitably droll to Fitzrovia, where poets mustached with bitter froth nibble nuts and gossip in equal measure. But all the way to monsoon mad Dhaka, that's a stretch. I should know. I was born and live here. Your pretty tales swinging into print under the bamboo, the banyan and the mango tree is the height of absurdity. Isn't that your point? Point taken. Now imagine the dread of a writer from Dhaka. Yes, a writer for Tomo Scriptor has a local branch, you know, and at bazaar booksellers, such things as lyric verse and motley bell letters peep out of routine stacks of exam guides like rusty needles. I too have perpetrated a few. But your unsolicited publicity may well put bait to the prospects of any pamphlet or book published in the humble streets of Dhaka. After all, Mr. Govidal, you are almost as famous as Vidal Sassoon. Your word may not be law, but it comes close in certain quarters, deservedly. In assailing the iniquitous, you never beat about the bush or blare like a bully. In my axiological tree, you are up there with Chomsky, Honderish, Arundhati. That makes your snide aside rankle all the more. Now, what are we to do, Mr. Vidal? Stop writing? 
And if we do not publish, join an immigration queue, hoping to head for the diaspora dead end, exhibit in alien multicultural museums. No way. Here I'll stay from in the center of monsoon mad Bengal, watching jackfruit leaves drift earthward in the early morning breeze, like a famous predecessor used to. And take note too of flashing knives, whirling sticks, bursting bombs, and accompanying gutturals and fricatives of hate, and evil that requires no access to turn on being everywhere. And should all these find their way into my scribbles and into print, I'll cut a joyous caper right here on the tropic of cancer, proud to be published once again in the streets of Dhaka. Now, it is post-colonial. Thank you, Dinesh Babu. It is post-colonial because the is the broad context in which it can be placed. But it is also a response to something that is uh, not only post-colonial. Now, uh, Gore Vidal making a snide comment about being published in Dhaka. This is a broader phenomenon. It's there. It's common um, throughout the world. Um, an Indian who is settled in the West and is doing well may come home and feel that he, is very, he or she is very superior and, you know, sort of be patronizing towards his uh, um, Indian, his resident Indian cousin. So, um, in the, that kind of patronizing attitude, it, it's something that has nothing to do with post-coloniality per se, um, it, it's almost a universal phenomenon where you have um, differences in, <clears throat> um, in, in a, a economic status, social status, uh, in the in, in the broad in the broad, broad sense, the power one one can wield. Uh, can, sorry, can you name any school of, what was the question here that popped up? Any school of poetry that this would belong to? I, I don't think it would belong to any particular school, but it is a critical response to a lot of issues. So Foster's comment, and then it goes into an account of that so the situation of someone who lives in an obscure place, uh, even in obscure places, and this is something that I've been thinking about lately, even in obscure places, art is created, literature is created, in whatever form, either in a, a modern written form or in a folk form. And every, every uh, manifestation of the creative uh, impulse, I think, deserves notice. So, um, if uh, the discourse of post-coloniality has taught me anything, I think this would be one thing that um, I think we should be more. Uh, yes, still be okay. So it, that uh, we should be more responsive to uh, non-mainstream forms of creativity which are still there. Um, for example, in Bangla, I know that the Puthi, you know, Puthis are still being written. No one bothers to collect them. I remember once uh, after Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated, I had to go to the village to attend the uh, Chehla Mutis and the Sando of uh, an uncle of mine and I had to take a bus. And as I boarded the bus, there was a chap peddling putty. Well, did you, what was the putty about? 
it was it dealt with the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi. So somebody had just composed this verse narrative in Poyad about this event and had taken the trouble of printing it in, you know, cheaply in a, into a kind of champ book and it, the, someone was selling it. I wish I had bought a copy. So the, this kind of creative expression is still can still be found, but we do, no one pays attention to them. You see? So um, when Govidal says published in the streets of Dhaka, and I say, well, yes, I'm, I'm proud to be published in the streets of Dhaka. That even in the streets of Dhaka, in the uh, bookstores in Bangla Bazaar, where you, the bookstores are uh, loaded with uh, guidebooks you know, for students, even there you will find one or two uh, books of poetry or short stories or a few novels. So, um, Homo Scriptor, Man the Writing Animal, is present everywhere. And uh, it's a pity that someone like Paul Vidal, who has otherwise you know, politically shown himself to be very uh, daring, should say such a thing. So, and, and then the uh, comment on the diaspora that, well, I mean, what is somebody who is born in a remote place, li likes living in, living in that place, and is creative? What is he to do? Should he become an immigrant, join the immigration queue, and join the diaspora dead end? Is it the use of the word dead end was deliberate because the uh, Western countries now are, pay a lot of attention to the promotion of multiculturalism. So in order to show that they are multicultural, so they will take, you know, take a few uh, um, immigrant writers or you know, try to promote them, show that they are very liberal and all that. And I mean, that also has a strange effect on the, those writers, you know. There are, there are certain multicultural, multicultural themes which uh, keep uh, uh, getting written about. So these have not been adequately studied. And then I say, okay, I take, make this stand uh, using Jibonalanda as a crutch, which you must have noticed. Um, and I actually translate the two, two of his lines. Uh, here I stay plumb in the center of monsoon mad Bengal, watching jackfruit leaves drift earthward in the early morning breeze, like a famous predecessor used to. And so um, I sort of take my stand that even here I can respond to what is going on around me, the violence and the hatred and all that. And if I can turn that into a literary form that attracts the notice of people and makes them think, I will consider myself uh, successful as a writer. So it therefore, it, um, uh, I think it deals with all the issues that we were talking about in the first part of this uh, session, you know, the uh, problem of uh, the power structure, uh, the global power structure, and then within that, the local power structure and the relationship of writers to uh, the colonial, to colonial history, to the post-colonial situation, to, the, to globalization. So I think, uh, broadly speaking, I think it has become clear by now that uh, after colonialism, you have post-colonial theory, which is a deconstruction of colonial discourse, and then that has evolved um, through all these concepts of transnationality, the, the diaspora, transnationality, translingualism, and then the, uh, um, the concept of world literature. So you can see this, say, if you take uh, one of the earlier post-colonial theorists and then to compare him with someone like uh, Arjuna Padurai, you can see that here he is responding to this, to the evolving uh, uh, sort of uh, scenario of globalization, and uh, it will keep evolving, and we'll have a lot of things that deserve looking into critically. Um, with that, let me uh, stop or pause because I would love to have some 
response from the audience, questions, comments, complaints, attacks, whatever. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, sir, for this brilliant exposition of the many issues. I I think Professor Hall's deliberation deserves a vibrant interactive session. Questions, comments, observations, please. The audience, I request all of you to come in. And give your state. Now I show this question open for questions and comments. Uh, yes, uh, Amida, yeah, uh, we are waiting for some of the questions to appear in the chat box. And then I'll read it out to Kukta okay. on behalf of the Department of English. Yes. Thank you. So before that, if somebody wants to ask a question, Please go forward. My esteemed colleague, Dr. Sohi Pandra who is going to moderate the question. Yes. One question is there. How long will the term post colonial continue? I think it will. No, the term will not die, but the uh, excitement with which we uh, took up post-colonial discourse, that has already become history, but uh, as a useful uh, label, as it were, it will remain. So even now, uh, memory studies is to be Yes, certainly memory studies can be a part of that uh, post-colonial discourse. Now, um, you know, th there are even now books and companions, uh, you know, handbooks are coming out. So, as a as a kind of critical envelope into which we can put different things, the term postcolonial will be around for for some time. So you have uh, you know, companions to postcolonial literature. Um, there's a Cambridge companion to post-colonial literature, by the way, which uh, has a, an essay by my friend uh, Lidishia Zakini on South Asian poetry, which I like very much, uh, not, not only because she's a friend and not only because uh, I, I'm mentioned very warmly, but it's a very uh, good uh, essay on the, on the subject, on South Asian poetry in the Cambridge. Uh, Companion to Postcolonial um, Poetry or Literature, edited by uh, Ramasani. So uh, I think we will have books like that. Um, one of the earliest uh, reference works was the Routledge Encyclopedia of Postcolonial Literatures, which was a massive undertaking. So I think the, what these studies, these books, these reference guides have done is to provide a, a critical framework in which that someone like me can be accommodated. See, otherwise, I mean, uh, so someone like me writing in English in Bangladesh, where English is not recognized officially as, a, as an acceptable medium of creative expression, you see, um, I, I'm not counted as a Bangladeshi writer. I mean, it's only now that uh, with the spread of English that uh, I mean, they're forced to acknowledge me, but otherwise, you see, the post-colonial um, umbrella uh, would provide some uh, you know, space for me. Um, then, uh, regarding the subcontinent, again, I have a point which I made in um, in the in, in my long introduction, my twenty thousand word introduction to the collected poems of uh, Shahid Sarwati, that uh, Shahid. I didn't guess that. Um, Shahid Sarwardi was well known in Calcutta as a colonial imperialism. Virtually synonymous, but um, even before imperialism, there was colonialism because uh, India was a colony, became, it became a part of the British Empire. 
Um, now, uh, Sir Varthi was on the, you used to sit in the Porichoy Anta, you were the great friend of Shudin Dotto and others, and uh, um, he was the Bhagishwari Professor of Fine Arts in Calgary University, he published his, uh, he was an art critic, a poet, he was uh, translated a Chinese poet. Now, uh, after partition, he was forgotten in India. Um, the Pakistanis remember him in Bangladesh. He is remembered, but he's, he's not read. So he's a, a, a classic victim of partition. Now, what? Why should that be? What I point out is that the you see the political partition is one thing, but the partitioning of the mind is another thing. And unfortunately, that has happened in this subcontinent. And if you compare our situation with that of Africa, now in Africa, um, a chief coming from Nigeria in Western Africa, and in Rudy coming from Kenya in Eastern Africa, they had a big debate at a literary confer conference on the subject of the, uh, the appropriate language for uh, African writing. And it was a, they really fought. So they were talking about African writing. Even though Africa is divided into so many countries, so many tribes, and there's so much of conflict and uh, you know violence going on. But the, the the division of the mind has not really. But in the subcontinent, we have really partitioned the mind, and that is, I think, something that needs to be redressed. Do you think the uh, yes? Uh, refugee studies can certainly be linked to post-colonial uh, studies. It can also be linked to transnationality. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, Amitabh Ghosh's uh, new novel, Gun Island, is a, a good example of, uh, you know, uh, I think this is the, the first time that serious literature has realistically portrayed the, the lives of people who become illegal immigrants who travel in strange ways and then try to cross the Mediterranean. And these issues, I think, this have been uh, dealt with for the first time in Amitabh Ghosh's uh, Gun Island in a very engaging and touching way. And it's also uh, I mean, uh, transnational because it uh, really straddles, the novel itself straddles uh, Bangladesh and uh, West Bengal. And then the action moves on to other parts of the world, to Europe, America, Europe. Sir, uh, hello, sir. Uh, Professor Himadri yes. Laidi is with us here. Sorry? Uh, Professor Himadri Lahiri has a question for you. Okay. Uh, do you think uh, the shifts of focus and tone are evident even while the term post colonialism goes on? I didn't catch you. The shift of focus and tone, uh, even while the term post-colonialism is on, basically. Shifts of focus and tone, yes, I think yes. you will find shifts of focus and tone um, even within post-colonialism, even before post-colonialism moves on. Say, I mean, among post-colonial writers, for example, I mean, if you compare uh, Derek Walcott with uh, Brathwaite, you know, Brathwaite championing the use of nation language, and Derek Walcott uh, uh, beginning as a very, uh, he still is a, is a mainstream uh, English poet, is uh, actually the only um, post-colonial poet who is uh, accepted in the mainstream as, you know, as one of them, as it were. So uh, his uh, uh, style, tone, focus is very different. At the same time, he has also incorporated elements of, uh, you know, a nation language. To give you an example, you know, when he, in uh, the schooner flight, he says, you know, I am just a red nigger who loved the sea. I had a sound colonial education. I have Dutch nigger and English in me, and either I am nobody. Or I'm a notion. I'm a nation. So um, you see, I'm a, just a red nigger who loves the sea. You see, this kind of uh, ungrammatical English. This is what the uh, this is the Caribbean 
patois, as it were. Um, so the you will find the varieties of uh, tonal varieties in any in any form of writing in the post-colonial. Uh, 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 one aspect of post-colonial uh, criticism is, of course, to um, foreground the use of Creole uh, local um, uh, um, idioms, uh, non-unconventional -conven rhythms. Um, so uh, that is very important. But at the same time, you also have um, writings which uh, follow the uh, accepted mainstream convention. So, like, uh, for example, you have Rajdi doing chapnification, but Vikram sir uh, writes very clear, you know, standard English. In the poem I've read out, I've deliberately used this, you know, standard English. Is I'm arguing with Mr. Gore Vidal, who also writes standard English. And I would call this uh, subcontinental standard English I have given it a name. It's not uh, King's English. I call it Maharaja's English. <laughs> uh, I think um, I, I think uh, uh, it's perfectly all right to use Maharaja's English because how you use it is important. What you use it to express is important, rather than the idiom itself. But uh, there is there should be this uh, freedom to choose the kind of idiom that one. Uh, Lights one feels close to. Yes. Um, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, our student Polomi Shah has an interesting question. She is asking how uh, memory studies is, is, is connected with post colonial literature. Yes. Um, I think, uh, yes, I, I saw the question. Definitely a very interesting connection. I think, well, um, in, uh, not only post colonial studies. It, I mean, just mainstream history also has uh, a lot to learn from memory studies. Uh, memory studies, oral history, and so um, I, I think there is now a, a, an effort to uh, bring these, uh, to, to foreground these uh, studies. And it's very important because otherwise um, much will be lost. You know? So uh, I think this is one of the ways of preserving uh, the traces of our experience. You see, these traces would otherwise be just uh, wiped out. And uh, it's important to maintain those traces. So, uh, which is why I like the, the name right, uh, the Gorbongo, University, University of Gorbongo. Because uh, otherwise in uh, uh, normal life, people don't use the word go anymore. anymore. But by using it for the university, you are uh, enabling us to remember it. And otherwise, uh, human beings have a tendency to forget because you know, the mind has, is always editing things out. And uh, there are some things which should not be edited out and should be you know, kept in our consciousness. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. And and Gorbongo also, um, apart from memory, it also refers to a space or a place uh, at the same time. And uh, the next question is is in connection with the poetics of space, as Bacalard, uh, I mean, uh, Edward Said in Orientalism refers to Bacalard, uh, use of the concept of poetics of space. So, Shumon Raj Banerjee <coughs> is asking, uh, how do you think the attitude of the post-colonial towards the West will be in terms of, uh, in times to come, especially with regards to the concept of space. So did you get it? Yes. The, I think is it the, the situation will become more and more complicated as um, you have more uh, South Asian writers who are also American. Um, Already, I think there are a number of uh, South Asian uh, writers <laughs> and uh, poets who are now American poets. They are not really seen as South Asian poets. So the attitude, the attitude will vary. Uh, what's his name? I forget his name. 
Yes, sir. Sir, just one last question. Uh, another from our student uh, yes. who is asking you to differentiate uh, maybe between colonialism and imperialism. <laughs> so, okay. uh, or is imperialism the first okay. state of colonialism? Okay. Um, it is possible to have a colony without an empire. I mean, India was a British colony before it became a part of the British Empire. So, British imperialism in India began really when Queen Victoria became the Empress of India uh, in 1858. So before that, it was a British colony uh, ruled indirectly by uh, through the uh, East India Company. So um, it is possible to have a colony without having an empire. In that case, you see. but uh, in general, I mean, you talk about the British Empire. Like there is in British Empire. And so after we became a part of the British Empire, we became uh, uh, we came under British imperialism. Um, the French were a colonial power; but they were not an imperial power uh, for much of the, you know, all the French colonies. Were um, I don't think they used the term empire. I made a mistake. They're, they're French colonies. And uh, even after we became a part of the empire, we didn't cease to be a colony. We were still a uh, part of the colonial uh, domain of uh, the British Empire. So I, th I think, I mean, imperialism is uh, the term becomes appropriate only when uh, there is an empire that is uh, the, the, you know, the ruling authority. Uh, are there any other questions from the uh, participants? Oh, Masiur Rahman uh, is asking you uh, about the Liberation War, the Bangladesh Liberation War. Uh, what is your take on it uh, from the post-colonial point of view? And would you write anything about it as well uh, in, in the days to come, maybe? Uh, uh. Well, uh, I've just written a couple of uh, essays about my experiences, and uh, the uh, Bangladesh Independence War was a. Di I mean, you can see a causal connection uh, between the the way the subcontinent was partitioned and the Bangladesh War, because um, as you know, the East, East Bengal, the East Bengali Muslims were all for Pakistan. They, they voted for Pakistan. And as soon as Pakistan came into being from 1948, it came into being in 1947, and in 1948 the language question came up. So the uh, the division really evolved and it widened. So first you have the language movement, and then with the dictatorship of General Ayub Khan later on, self the self promoted uh, Field Marshal Ayub Khan. Um, the economic uh, gap widened, even though I mean, uh, what was East Pakistan was earning more for foreign currency. So uh, the resentment then led to the uh, uh, Six Point Movement, the, eventually the war. Um, the, the crackdown was the sort of last straw, and uh, I. I don't know how, I, if, if I write an extended autobiography, this will, a lot of things will come in. I've been publishing little autobiographical essays here and there, but uh, I think that it's time to uh, produce a book and work. Uh, let's see. Wish me luck. <laughs> I think I'll get out to that. Uh, on, uh, in 71, on my way to the sector, in, uh, I fought in uh, Dinashpur. We had some friends there, and uh, after crossing the border to Agartala, I came to Calcutta to meet some friends, and from there I went to West Dinashpur. And on the way, I stopped at Malda station and uh, to spend the night there because there was no connecting train uh, until morning. So I spent the night on Malda, on the platform of Malda station, and uh, remember that uh, night very clearly. 
<laughs> it is wonderful to hear that, sir. <laughs> uh, there was one question I didn't get time to answer about the COVID crisis and literature. I think uh, it will certainly leave a mark. And uh, the COVID crisis has made us, has reminded us of the earlier influenza epidemic of 1819, uh, which uh, you know took 15 to 17 million lives in the subcontinent. Even Gandhiji was uh, infected and worldwide from 50, uh, 50 to 100 million. We don't know the exact figure. And, uh, but we have forgotten about it until this crisis, it reminded us of the earlier one. And then I started looking at the literary uh, traces, uh, literary response to that. Uh, I found one in uh, uh, Ahmed Ali's novel, Twilight in Delhi. There are two, two chapters which uh, give a very moving and uh, vivid description of the, uh, you know, uh, the influenza epidemic. And Rabindranath himself and Shanti Nikodon was uh, giving out um, Ayurvedic uh, medicines to people in the hope that they would prevent the, uh, uh, you know, the influenza from, from infecting them. So um, I think uh, uh, pandemic studies, I think, is uh, something that needs looking into. Anyway. Uh, the last question, we'll take one last question from uh, Shushmita Pial. Uh, sir, does post-colonial cosmopolitanism yes. call for nationalism? And if so, why is it necessary to write in a foreign language for a foreign audience? No. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I think a lot of nationalists will say they're also cosmopolitans. I mean, each person has to work out uh, where one stands. Regarding the question of language, um, I think we have to remember one thing, that the... the okay. Uh, the mother tongue is not always the literary language. And I mentioned that in ancient India, for example, people would speak Prakrit or some other dialect, but write in Sanskrit. And then people would speak Bangla or Hindi and write in Farsi. Uh, similarly, you know, people speak Bangla, Hindi, Tamil, whatever, uh, at home and write in English. So the choice of a literary language uh, depends on many factors. I think the, the uh, childhood education is important. So um, I went to English medium schools from day one. And uh, when uh, I had to decide what language to write in, I think it, it uh, naturally, sort of, it's quite natural for me to choose English. At the same time, uh, it's not that I'm, I do not read Bangla, I read Bangla. And it, I mean, uh, Srikanto is one of my favorite novels. <laughs> and one day I hope to write about that. I will write about that at length. So, um, Ajivan Dash is one of my favorite poets. Um, I've translated from Bangla into English. Um, poets like Chuit Dadri, Shantaraman, uh, Rabindranath's uh, novella, uh, Chuturangu, and uh, uh, some other stuff. So, um, in a sense, in that sense, I'm straddling two, two languages, even though my my literary language is English. Now, um, for South Asians who uh, grow up in the West, the, the answer is very easy. They have to write in the language of the country they are living in. In South Asia, um, uh, we have a very, very strong tradition of writing in English, which began in uh, 1884 with the publication of the travels of Sheikh Din Muhammad and continues today. So um, I, I think it's one cannot legislate what language one will write in. And uh, every language is also changing. Um, languages are also absorbing uh, elements from uh, other languages. In a sense, we all lead multilingual existences. I think because we are bombarded by many different languages, so we pick up a bit of this, a bit of, a bit of that. Uh, if you uh, pick up any contemporary Bangla novel, um, I mean, 
you will be uh, in, in, with an eye on the uh, particular idiom used, you'll be surprised at the number of English words that uh, occur in the Bangla sentences. So um, I don't know how the so how even Bangla is going to evolve. Um, then there's a the question of Bangladesh to Bangla and the literary Bangla of Calcutta. So I didn't get the question. So anyway, <clears throat> so um, and um, interaction between the two uh, the literatures of the two Bengals is I think very important. Um, I think there ought to be more, uh, so that um, you know, questions of uh, broad uh, outlook, philosophy, um, the idiom used. You see, if if, we, if, if, there, if there is interaction between peoples, uh, a lot of these questions become uh, thrashed out at a, at, a, at, a, at a very practical level. So, if we kept talking, you know, um, we'd arrive at a common uh, shared, shared idiom. You know. Yes, sir, sir, thank you very much uh, for for uh, not only answering all these questions, but patiently listening to all the queries and addressing them. Uh, Amida, uh, we, we can move towards the closing uh, session now. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Hall. Not only for your illuminating lecture, but also your very candid and very incisive answers to the questions that have been put to you. It was really wonderful listening to you. You not only charted out the trajectory of an educational project from colonial to post colonial. And then what? That is beyond the post colonial divide. So it, it is really nice that you have pointed this out in your lecture that while talking about post post colonial literature or post post colonial poetry, the prefix post plays a very important role because it goes beyond while retaining the traces and echoes of the former time, of the former ideological position. So post-colonial -post poetry, as you have hoped and shown us, will retain traces of post-colonial standpoint and at the same time go beyond it to address issues that have come up in our present day situation. The internet, the globalization projects, transnationalism, and the overall embracing of difference that literature should at least aim at, though it not always does that, but it should aim at. And that is what you have pointed out. For example, you told us about a possible dream project, a kind of an internet poetry community, where people from Rwanda, from Fiji, from Bangladesh, from Calcutta or Ulaanbaatar can also take part in this kind of a piece of idea. So thank you for this excellent presentation. And I hope to hear from you in future as well. My dear friends, thanks for listening to this session of the online series. Yes, the fishful network is a very big problem. Sometimes you go off the street, sometimes the sound does not come through, but still we are trying because, like Okna, we know that humanity will not endure, it will prevail in the long run. So I hope to bring to you other sessions of online lecture series that we are organizing. The next online lecture that we will present before you will be delivered on the 13th day of this month. It will be delivered by Dr. 
অনন্যা বক্তব্য ফ্রম বিশ্বভারতী শি উইল টক অ্যাবাউট দ্য ইন্টারসেকশন বিটুইন লিটারেচার অ্যান্ড দ্য ভিজুয়াল আর্ট অ্যান্ড দ্য টাইটেল অফ আর লেকচার উইল বি patient so thank you very much amit for your warm reception and uh, thank you all I, I, it's been a real pleasure to uh, travel uh, in, in virtual space to uh, the university of golbongo and i hope uh, we'll meet again in future thank you very much <laughs>